The average laugh consists of he's, ha's, or he's. There's even the ho sound, but unless you own an elfin sweatshop, you probably don't use it. Begin to say hot, but stop before you reach the T, and you have the start of normal laughter. Say heap, but stop before the P, evil laughter. Say head, but drop the D, sneaky laughter. But hat, hat without the T is something else. I came here to Cambridge 13 years ago to, to teach at Harvard and walked into this bookstore before I even got to the university part. I walked into this bookstore and I thought, this is the real goal, uh, is, 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 is to have an event like this and, 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 and pull together a lot of people and talk literature. So I'm, I'm extremely excited you're all here tonight. This is, this is, this is wonderful. Um, the idea for Pangyrus as a literary journal came from year after year of teaching fiction writing and non creative nonfiction workshops uh, in the college and, 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 and then in the extension school and the Kennedy School. In each class, the generating, you know, having students generate amazing writing and having the class as a whole come together as a community and then everybody disperses and everybody then had their private individual um, hell, I think is, is the right word for it, of trying to get published. And I thought, you know, the, the, it's weird how we build up all of this and, 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 and all these people come together who care about writing and literature and then we disperse and, and, and the community vanishes and it's as if we all have to be in, in our own private hell struggling. And I thought, somebody's got to do something about this. And then I thought, oh, I, I, I can do something about this. I'll start a journal. It will have the orientation of being about community and it will, it will invite people out and will create events like this and, and, and try to reach out to authors um, in a different way. Um, the, uh, it's amazing we're at the point of technology where you can print the book. You can actually watch it printed live in the back of the store by Page M. Gutenberg, Gutenberg the machine. Um, and, uh, and, and what that technology means is also you have amazing flexibility as a journal. You can print. Uh, we, we, we can print uh, in various configurations as we build up a library of, of fiction, poetry. We can come out with specialized editions all quite, quite easily. And, and again, it's, it's in the service of, of having more readers and having more writers reach readers. And so um, you're an absolutely crucial part of this. So uh, again, thank you for coming out. What I've learned from teaching writing when I met my first students 41 years ago, I knew zip about, uh, about how to teach. I really shouldn't have been hired. At the beginning, I told my class of high schoolers to go home and write. This proved about as, ha as helpful as asking a toddler to bake a ch chocolate souffle. Then, on a whim, I gave them all the same prompt. This produced valuable results. They asked for more prompts, exercises that highlight specific elements of fiction. So the first lesson I learned as a teacher was that when you tackle a new skill, you want and need structure. This is just like practicing doing scales when mastering a musical instrument. It's not fun, but it helps get you there. Strong, fresh writing means taking 26 letters and putting them into combinations that no one has ever seen before. Sounds easy. It's as hard as doing a perfect figure eight backwards on the ice. There seems to be a built-in resistance to following directions. I learned patience from my students who took a reasonable two-page exercise. I gave them two pages as a, no more, the, no more and no less, just write two pages. To a reasonable two-page exercise and messed around with it so that it lost its desired shape and objective. An example, the psycho. A two-page exercise asks the students to have someone taking a shower and hearing a strange noise outside the bathroom door, knowing that no one else has a way, has a way of getting inside the house. At, ha at least half my students used up their precious space explaining how and why the person is going to take a shower. <laughs> <coughs> 
one of them had the person starting off in another town. <laughs> I'm not making it up. From then, I, from them, I learned patience and resignation, although not so much about sympathy. My exercises, combined with those of writer-teacher Pamela Painter, grew into What If? Writing Exercises for Fiction Writers, a textbook that has remained in print since it was first published in 1980. It sells because it works. Early on, I learned that most beginning writers are emotionally velcroed to their work, so that if you criticize something they've written, you're really declaring them worthless, aren't you? <laughs> you may remind them that in order to master any skill, it's essential to do it over and over and over again. In all my years of teaching hundreds of men and women, I've only encountered two or three who were what I call natural writers, those who seem to know instinctively how to do it. They're gold medal athletes of the sentence. They don't need writing classes. As anyone who has ever taught writing knows, it, it's crucial that the writer tell the truth. This is probably the single most important thing I've learned as a teacher and how hard it is to dig out that little chunk of truth, sometimes sweet, more often bitter. It's the family secret you don't want to face, the wound that still aches, the thing that might reveal yet another truth. I tell my students to write from the pain. For most, this is a hard lesson. It's easier to write the sunny hours, studded with cliches, reeking of sentimentality. Along the way, I learned that fresh, strong friction grows out of both skill with sentences and a deep understanding of how people act. It's not about description, although it's essential, essential to let your readers know where we are. It's not about symbolism, take that word and bury it along with nuclear waste. Not about backstory, it's about what people do to each other, often in rage, despair, jealousy, betrayal, and other toxic emotions. This is very difficult to teach. The best way to learn it is to read, read, and read the fiction of, those you of the writers you admire. There's no getting around this. You can talk about it in class. You can point it out in the life around you. You can create exercises that force the student to face facts that are usually not attractive, but nothing beats getting it through the work of the novels and short stories by wonderful writers. One of my exercises is killing the neighbor's dog. It asks the student to present a motive for and a description of the actual slaughter. <laughs> I'm not a br brute. I couldn't kill a dog. I have a hard time squashing an ant. But the great thing about writing fiction is it allows you to temporarily take over the mind and heart of almost anyone in the same way an actor assumes the identity of, say, an ER doctor or a serial killer. I've learned, too, that writing strong fiction is the product of several disparate skills, some of them having to do with the way sentences and paragraphs are constructed, and the rest with human psychology. Look for the reason this woman is always smiling, I tell them. Sometimes I think they're, uh, they think I'm inviting them to be cynics. No, I say, but you must be skeptical. There's an enormous difference. If it really happened, it's probably not going to make a good, a good written story. That's a very hard lesson to learn. I never would have realized this without having taught. Real life is not fiction. Fiction is taking what really happened and tweaking it, reshaping, expanding, contracting, twisting it, giving it longer arms and shorter legs, and finally stamping it with the way you would create it if you were good. God. <laughs> good God. <laughs> Either way. Either way.
Okay, good is God, God is good. And as far as your stories, a story and characters are concerned, you have to believe you are God. You make things happen, you give life to imaginary people. You can teach an old dog new tricks, that's me. It was only within the last year or so that I learned the difference between possible and plausible. One of my favorite novels is Time and Again by Jack Finney. Does anybody know that novel? Great, great novel? Time and Again by Jack Finney. In this illustrated novel, Finney takes his protagonist back from the present to 1911 and the terrible fire in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in downtown Manhattan. There are a great many possible human activities. Time travel is not one of them. But by ingenious plotting and technically brilliant psychological maneuvering, Finney, Finney makes our hero's trip entirely plausible. In the same way we believe in the magic of Dorothy's ruby slippers, beginning writers should take some time to think about this distinction between possible and plausible. It's the fiction writer's job and its own reward to make the impossible plausible. Thanks. I'm going to read from the piece that Pangyrus published, um, which is a flash fiction piece called Fern Gully. And I'll dive into it. If, on a first and final return to your parents' island as a unit, your family must choose between routes to Jamaica's northern coast from Kingston, know this. Both twist over cliffs at inclines that compel drivers to build velocity and zoom blindly around bends. Both force cars to hug brink or escarpment when dodging oncoming traffic. But assuming your family survives this drive, only one of these routes will take you through Fern Gully. Fern Gully is supernatural. It's tunnel grown of ferns, pulsating walls curved up into a chlorophyllous canopy it's acid green searing through your eyes into your brain. If your parents take this route, make sure they pull off the thoroughfare and exit the car with you. Let your mom hold your hand, but when she's not paying attention, break away into a field of lime green fiddleheads, grown taller than you'll ever be. Their fibers dangle white, as thick as your hair. Try to wrap your hands around one stalk. Grasp its felt like fibers, downy and supple on your palm. This is softer than anything you will feel again. Kneel to inspect a newborn fern, one that sprung to your knee. Rub your finger along the curve of its head. Feel the frond's silky baby fleece. If your mother calls after you, if she says it's time to leave, pluck this fiddlehead from the earth and keep it as proof of magic. If you wait to ask permission, she will tell you not to bother. We have ferns in our backyard, she will say. You'll ask why you've never seen them. How could you have never noticed? She'll promise to point them out when you get back. When you return to the States, not the first day, but after she has rested some, she will take you out back and point to a plant in a white pot sitting on the ground and say, see, see, and you will see nothing, nothing but a dull green houseplant. Um, so the, I'm gonna read just the very beginning of a story that was, uh, it was the editor's pick for Solstice Magazine's summer contest. Um, it's called Stripper Pants, it's on their website if you feel compelled to finish the story there. Um, I'm just gonna read the beginning. I don't think there's much of a preface that I need or want to give it, um, but I might ask that you forgive me for what you're about to hear. <laughs> My brother has a prostitute living with us. She came home with him one night and never left. 
I don't know her name, but there are a number of traits I have picked up on. First off, she steals. She sneaks into my bathroom at night to steal toilet paper, uses the whole damn roll. She leaves a trail of puddles on the floor and counter as evidence. Every time she washes her hands, she leaves puddles. I can't step into the kitchen without wearing galoshes. And the new roll of paper towels I just set out, gone. She claims she's a germaphobe. I don't believe her. She won't kiss friends or new acquaintances on the cheek like normal people in Miami. Won't even shake hands. Claims she can't risk the germs. But when I bumped into my brother and her at a Jock Here concert two weeks ago, she was on her way to the porta potty. <laughs> what kind of germaphobe uses a porta potty? <laughs> my girlfriend, Jelly, pointed this out to me. And where's her hand sanitizer, she asked me. Where's the Purell? On top of being a liar and a thief, she's racist. At the concert, she looked uncomfortable to be around so many black people. She didn't dance or grind on my brother like your average party girl would. Just stood there gripping her purse like it was the last banana at Monkey Jungle. Plus, one day last week, I overheard her telling my brother about a guy who'd harassed her. He called me a white trash slut. So I said, what's that, nigger? I can't hear you, nigger. My brother found this funny. He laughed anyway. Her recounting of the story echoed down the hall and out into the living room. I felt abruptly aware of my own blackness the moment I heard her say it. My brother, on the other hand, he's not black. He's West Indian. His waist-length dreads and just lighter than a brown paper bag skin tone make him look like one of the Marleys, or so he enjoys being told. He sings Three Little Birds on karaoke Thursdays at the old Cutler sports bar three blocks over. The regulars buy him pictures of Budweiser. He's a staple there. It's where he met his prostitute. They came barreling in that first night, shit-faced, shouting as if they were still at the bar. Jelly was in bed with me, lying still, but I knew she'd woken when I had. The first words I made out from this tart when I got my tits done, she inflected every declarative into a question, like a Jeopardy contestant, like one who'd just been punched in the air by Kimbo Slice. The doctor told, the doctor told me I couldn't fly across the Atlantic, like ever, my brother asked. <laughs> Jelly groaned. Maybe she can float across, I grumbled. Go tell him to shut up. Jelly jabbed her elbow into my ribs. Let's give him a minute. Maybe he'll put something in her mouth to keep her quiet. So you want this or what? The girl's voice became businesslike. My brother lowered his to match. You think you can let me hit it free? Jelly sucked her teeth. Your brother's weak. I have to get up for school in like an hour. The girl said something I couldn't make out, followed by a high-pitched, please say something Jamaican. Away I say, airman a baby, take away your frock and make me love when I'm good tonight. I'd started pulling my pants on when we first heard the cackle. You see, the average laugh consists of he's, ha's, or he's. There's even the ho sound, but unless you own an elfin sweatshop, you probably don't use it. Begin to say hot, but stop before you reach the T, and you have the start of normal laughter. Say heap, but stop before the P, evil laughter. Say head, but drop the D, sneaky laughter. But hat, hat without the T is something else. Said once, silent T hat, is an acceptable, albeit obnoxious way to tell someone they're full of shit. But imagine, hat, hat, hat. Raise the pitch and volume and picture this rhythm. Hat, 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 hat. Nine hats. Every time, nine hats. 
I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> this is very surreal to me. Uh, my husband, he's also a poet and professor. He, we uh, just moved here. Uh, he's teaching at Wheaton College. Um, we were living in West Virginia for five years, teaching down there, and uh, we have a nine-month-old baby. This is the first babysitter she's ever had tonight. This is the first time I've ever been to Harvard Square, so we're just kind of like, this is weird. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a poem from my first book of poems. Um, <clears throat> uh, Anne was talking about cynicism versus skepticism, and that really uh, struck a chord with me. Um, that's something that I think um, my book is dealing with a lot, um, being skeptical, but often being most understood. The, the voices, um, who are often female voices, and I think um, skeptical women are often misunderstood, um, skeptical female voices. Um, the first poem I'm going to read from this book uh, is called Another Farewell Song. Oh, music, you can give it and take it. We thought you'd make us unlike fences would give us bodies to swim dirty seas or lives like the old trees, give us wars and banners for the wars, loves like war, banners against love, a love against wars, give us oars to paddle and paddle, hit land and waddle, stamp right up to the kiss, the storm, the tower and ring the bell. Again, again, we listened and we took off terry cloth, we didn't know how to moan. We listened. We didn't know what was better than the moans. We couldn't stop yelping, I'm not ready for this, whispering, so this, so this, so this is what it's like. We would be firm and shiny after the song. Better said, we'd be fit astronauts ready for moon sex. Oh, that's what we should have said, should have been. Of course, we can't remember which song that was. Once during the music, we were low. We were ugly kid low. Nobody's eyes would have given us birth. Toads, heads like shovels. But we couldn't turn it off. Would we feel worse? We were, were we down before the songs? So we kept listening. We hoped to leap. We were going to say, I'm taking the last cookie, the kids, the hammer. I'll take it with hot sauce. I'll take on the whale. I'm quitting this toilet and moving on to become a star. All of it, all of it, just after the song. The turntable was turning, and the best thing we could think of was to turn it backwards. Hit me, Jack. I'm the road. You'd say, let go. There must be a letting go. There is no go to let. We've heard the song about souls. We've heard the song about paper souls. We listened, folded, folded, and folded, but we just made crumpled trash. We've heard the one about truck driving and making it. We've heard the song sung with wit, one with rage and wit. We couldn't do anything but list. We listen and listen until they're just songs again. The old trees are just standing luck. Nobody wants to think of the way songs never end. Even if there's no reason, no need to play music during dinner with meat, we still bite, sometimes down on our blind, fixed tongues. We still cut and section our lives with refrains. We can't have a gala without them. We can't put the babies to sleep. Play the one about the lonely who get, who get the courage to admit their loneliness, or the one about the lonely who one day die lonely. One more time, let's hear of the roses that ruin the raindrops. Babies, go back to bed. And while there may not actually be any sad gals, play their tune anyway. Yes, the gals will, the gals we, will keep waiting for their love to lose its lyrics, but the gals always find their way home. Uh, I'm going to read the poem that's uh, published in Pangyrus. Uh It's from... This, a second book that I'm working on, I've been working on it for a long time, um, and it's a lot of the poems are obsessed with uh, visual art and lines, but they're not um, ekphrastic, they're just um, wishing they could sort of do what visual art does, but at the same time loving that they're poems. Will you line up the children? For pigtails, balance beams, cracks to break your mother's back, everything lines. I wrote loops. Not over and over, but forward and forward, 
and my line was a graphite bow, a graphite flight performing an air show, a telephone cord to stories and signatures, a sideways gallop, put a word in, even bird, not even a kind of bird. I would write that bird to be a lace bird, a paltry bird, a saffron sparkle word bird. That year, all the words would fall into my lines, even chair for you to sit down while my line kept going. I would learn cursive and go. I was a dot in Minnesota, an I-90. I had learned about the West and the East. A ray is a dot with a line leaving it that never ends. This young thing wants to pirouette on power lines. This young thing says his thoughts are kite string. I'm putting children in all of my lines. I have a tightrope to skim above the sea, an assembly line of square cheese. Language meet lines, lines meet language. Those side Twombly chalk squiggles, knots of excuses, flaneur through garbage, a stomp to the bus. Children fall into me, make breasts, silhouettes. I've been writing lines all of this time. Thanks, and I'm just gonna read one more um, newer poem. Would you hold this egg, please? This, would you hold this egg, egg, please? This is an, ex an encyclopedia of holding. This is a fashion spread of eggs that were held and eggs that were not held. This is a time machine to go back to every moment you were asked a favor and wonder if it was actually a favor. Will you tell me if there's anything I can do? Will you tell me if I offend you? It's as easy as machine gun practice on eggs for targets. Let me know if my cat's scratch leaves a scar. Those friends aren't doing you a favor, no those, nor those stripes on that shirt, nor chuckling to yourself about uh, looking ugly wearing stripes, nor rolling your eyes at anyone who attempts to make you chuckle. Your eyes are a letdown too because they're a better blue than your shirt's stripes. Those lips aren't doing you a favor, but they sure make you look good. I bet you know what it looks like when you speak to others and you talk to yourself, that you simply talk to yourself because it feels beautiful to know you look good. Someone told me the definition of narcissism is to know what you look like when you're talking to someone else. A moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, he said one other time. Some people would consider this a warning a compliment, but only if you were too beautiful to wreck yourself with a second dessert. The moment I eat all the desserts, I'll become all the hips, an encyclopedia of lifetimes. Look at all these references to the times we've been held. Thanks. So I spent some months uh, reporting about the women who work in the red light districts in Mumbai, um, prostitutes who live in a very different way than the one we already heard about today. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt from a longer piece. I am seated cross-legged on a brothel floor on a hot April afternoon. The door is ajar. Just behind it, a disheveled man in a gray pinstriped shirt appears at the top of the dank staircase, ducking to avoid banging his head on the low ceiling. The hinges creak as he slips in. Is Lata here? He asks. Lata has gone back to the village, said Roshni, a chatty woman with bulging hips who, now in her 30s, has risen up the ranks to become the keeper of this three-room affair. But you can sit with Pyle if you like. To sit, baitna in Hindi, is a euphemism sex workers use. The man looks at Pyle, plopped on a, seat, on a bamboo mat on the floor beside me, the ringlets in her hair escaping from a loose bun. He hesitates. Payal remains silent, expressionless, tuned to the 14-inch TV on the wall rather than the prospective customer. His eyes slip from her to me. He shakes his head no and slinks back down the stairs. My obviously alien presence embarrassed him, I know. He was squeamish about buying sex while an outsider watched. I'm torn between satisfaction that my interview wasn't interrupted and guilt over depri depriving Pyle of rare afternoon business. I'm no longer naive enough to believe I've saved her from the indignity of selling her body. Roshni resumes narrating the story of how she ended up in Mumbai. 
The burn scars on her upper arms mark when her husband doused her with a pot of boiling mutton stew. Roshni demonstrates how she had been curled up at the time, with my legs like this, held against my chest, she says. It's a good thing, or I would have gotten completely burned. I just had an operation to stop myself from having babies. Roshni left home that day with her two young children. For hours, she walked along a country road because she couldn't bear the humiliation of sitting on a bus reeking of mutton stew. At her parents' house, the husband of her older sister tried to sleep with her. So she left and found a job as a maid at a hotel. The owner tried to take advantage of her. She accepted a woman's offer to work at a cotton shop in Mumbai. It turned out to be a brothel. But by the time she realized she'd been tricked, it was too late. Roshni had children to feed, whether by working loom or loins. Roshni's story is hardly unique. In dozens of interviews with sex workers and their children, almost all have told me stories of absent men, usually dead fathers or drunk, abusive husbands, illiteracy and no decent jobs. In addition to their own sustenance, a great many are responsible for their elderly parents, daughters, and sons. Besides the mental strain, reporting from Kamatipura poses another challenge. I am an outsider. I must be careful. When I visited the brothels as a college student, the field workers of the NGO I volunteered with never left me alone. A young woman, fair and tall, they told me, would attract curious and lewd stares from pimps and johns. They sought to avoid trouble. When I decided to return to Kamatipura as a reporter, I still didn't feel comfortable walking around the area and going into the brothels completely alone. I came to an agreement with a non-governmental non, non organization that allowed me to come to their office, a hole in the wall sandwiched between a shoe repair store and a vendor for fried snacks and I would accompany the staff to the brothels for health checkups and to distribute condoms. I tell them where I will be and I'm free to speak with whoever I want. They pick me up when it's time to leave. Roshni, at the end of our interview, asks the usual dreaded questions. Why are you writing all this down? What are you going to get out of it? I stumble to convey how I desire to be the sort of reporter who doesn't chase the news but tells the stories of people without a voice, without recourse. But Silesh, a transgendered sex worker and peer counselor at the NGO who has come to collect me at the end of my visit, cuts me off. See, you and me, he says to Roshni, we're from this line. What line? I wonder. She, Silesh motions to me with his chin is from the family line. People from the family line, they think sex, wor sex workers only do dhanda, sex work. But there's more to our lives. We have home, we cook food, we have children. She wants to see what that is. She writes it down so she can tell other people in the family line that actually, this is what sex workers do. The family line. I never thought about it that way before. But the phrase makes sense in the context of a group that feels shunned by India's intractable notions of family values and rigid morality. I belong to a different line, not because of socioeconomics, but because of my ability to have familiar, familial relationships instead of transactional ones. Danda. Thank you. So I'h uh, start off the evening with uh, Anne Bernays' uh, delightful essay on teaching writing. And when you take uh, poetry writing classes, um, you're told fairly often about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And one of the things that you hear you shouldn't ever do is write poems about poetry, you know, write poems about writing poetry. And you certainly should never write a poem and title it On the Origin of Poetry. <laughs> but she was never coming through the snow. The cottontail's earth door gapes, and in its cold throat, her kitten waits. Nobody was hearing him. Across the field, her blood-stuck frame mattered violently. 
Beneath her ribs, a steamer trunk was crushed, still stuffed with smoking jewels, crepuscular purples, crimsons losing to their gravity, diamonds shut at the core, forgotten, which you pay for with your life. And what of the kitten? Fed, not with mother's milk, not with mother's blood, but with their absence as if the earth had gulped its shadow and was pregnant with it and couldn't give birth. Poem beginning in the body and ending in a landscape. Partly wreckage, see left leg not going as the leg once went, not light the way the light once went before the light went dim and a field grew out of the dimness. Snow lay on the field like a Gettysburg of mice in white uniforms, white combat boots and their small white rifles spent beside them. A blanket of mice all down the hill, then drifts of mice at the foot of the hill glared sharply in the darkness, like a photo of the moon in hard sunlight and the tops of the campus trees iced over also glared. A partly wreckage, the arms not going as the arms once went, names no longer clinging to their things, ascending like a scarf of gathered breaths to hang a few feet in the air above the field. My boy, my self, I'm sorry that I had to leave you there with snow all up your sleeves and your snow pants soggy and your left glove missing and your buckled boots. That's the way the light goes out of the world. And if this poem were a dream, I'd see myself sledding downhill over mice, mittened hands gripping the wooden handles of my flexible flyer, my face directed downwards toward the drifts, my legs bent upwards, boot soles pointed toward the sky, starless over glowing earth. The boy's intention circulates at will through his limbs like water through a network of pipes which will one day rust and stand empty. The boy's house stands empty and the walls at one another glare. In the kind of silence that the voice of builders who arrive one Monday morning to take the walls down cannot demolish, but which goes on beneath the rip of saws and hammers, curses, shouts, rough laughter, the boy's house tells its stories. Even after another house is raised on its empty footprint and another family moves in. The silence underneath the house goes on and the darkness of that earlier time still looks in at the windows that are no longer there. And the mice in the field go on being dead and warm like a foot of April snow. There are deeper silences underneath the silence, inaccessible but not destroyed. The silence of the people who passed this way before, like dark trees flowing together up a hill. And at the top of the hill, they reach long fingers, sticky with pitch, up into the low dark sky to fasten jewels there, like lights fixed in the rafters of an attic. Or maybe the boy sliding downhill in the dark is dreaming me. I hope that's true because that would mean the boy's alive and not alone, and the world is dark and for a moment safe, with the real wind pouring through the campus trees. My left hip hurts and the instep of my left foot not going as the foot once went, but the boy sleds like water running over ice and the mice glow softly in the field. He's coming downhill the way that I remember him now that he's disappeared. One more. A 
composition. One, formed of the sun, my eyes, that fire. My hands from some deep trench swam up to colonize my arms. But what about the spine? Burned wood. The mind is not a thing or form or member. No, it's less than that. A larva groping in the skull's dark stump. It knows damp stone, the taste of bitten tin, the track through rot and smear. And when it lollops from the ear, the body smokes and falls. Two, a buckled pitch pine whimpers like a mastiff, stutters like a drowsy fire. A fire dog wintered in this spurt of pitch until his fur fell out, until his skin went bad and cracked. The fire dog found me sprawling, stood me upright, licked my hair awake. We stood quite close, looking off in opposite directions. I could hear his breathing like a basement furnace gasping on. This is what I came to tell you. If the fire dog finds you, kiss him on his hot black lips. You are formed of fire and the weight of water and bones that slide inside their sleeves for generations in the dark. Thank you. Thank you again to, to all our readers. That was uh, wonderful, wonderful. Right. There were laws against um, foreign languages and particularly German language throughout the states in that time. It was considered more patriotic to speak American. And I hope this resonates with some things that are happening today.